so sometimes when we hold our ideas so they're perfect, we miss our moment. We miss the moment to get the idea out in the market. And so once we start to release that idea in the market, that's when the momentum builds and that's when customers give us feedback and that's when we can evolve that. Welcome to Navigation and Discovery with Cameron Singh. On today's episode, we have Natalie Bourne on the podcast. She is an innovation facilitator, consultant, author, keynote speaker, and the host of the Innovation Meets Leadership podcast. So what we're going to be talking about is Natalie's brand new book that she recently released, Set It on Fire, The Art of Innovation. So we're going to be talking about the topic of innovation, trying out new things, giving it a go, doing it afraid, and topics in that nature. So I really hope that you enjoy this podcast interview with Natalie Bourne. And if you would like to find out more about Natalie and, and her bio, you can find that in the podcast description on whichever platform that you are listening on. So hope you enjoy this interview with Natalie Bourne. Well, thank you so much, Natalie, for, for being on the podcast. Happy to have you on, on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Cameron. I'm excited to be here with you and all your listeners. Awesome. So we're here to talk about your latest book, Set It on Fire, The Art of Innovation. It's been a joy going through this book, just going through this book and the study guide along with it. I feel like it's it's it spoke a lot to me because I'm a huge champion of innovation and the work that you're doing. Um, so let's start off by, can you share the heart of your latest book, Set It on Fire, and what made you want to write a book on innovation? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I uh, had this thought one day, like, man, wouldn't it be great if everyone had an innovation consultant, like somebody that could come alongside of them whenever they had an idea and they didn't know how to get started, or maybe they had a great idea. They just didn't know um, how to launch it, who to talk to, what to do, what's the frameworks of how I get started. And so that started this journey for me of saying, well, we can give people that through this book. I want it to, uh, it's a little bit about my journey, my personal story. So there's a lot of me and, and literal innovations that worked and didn't work, but then there's also just, you know, parts of my story in it. And I weave that through with different frameworks and different ways to actually get started. And so my heart, my goal with this book was to really literally come alongside someone and say, if you have an idea let me walk you through how to launch it all the way from idea through development and into uh, launch, right? At your go-to-market strategy, what does that need to look like? And how do you go end to end with anything, right? Any idea you have, anything you want to put out there in the world. Yeah, so you start off the book by talking about how have, having a strong foundation helps accelerate innovation. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the best practices and unpack this for us a little bit? Uh, what are some of the best practices or ways that you would recommend to have that strong foundation? Yeah, I kind of start from the beginning almost. It's almost like, you know, just starting from the very start of, of an organization, their foundation, which is your vision, mission, values, and your goals. And I start there because to me, um, you know, when I talk to some organizations and you go to the frontline employees, a lot of times they don't even know how to articulate their vision or mission. Like, what is it? Why do we exist? What are we here to do? And so to me, everything has to be built on top of that foundation of your vision, mission, values, and goals. And when your vision is compelling enough, um, people start to innovate on their own. When your vision is compelling enough, people own that vision for themselves. They don't feel like, you know, oh, that's the company's vision that I'm loosely tied to. They actually feel, no, I'm a part of this vision. I'm a part of the bigger solution for what's coming to market. And so I just love the idea that if we build it on a good foundation of why did you start the organization? Why does the, you know, what are the values that matter to the organization? And then you begin to build from there. Um, that's your foundation. That's the sturdiness that we want to build things on. And really that begins to develop into what your culture is, right? So your culture becomes a lens through which everyone sees the organization. So that becomes the foundation to build innovation on. And I say it, you know, so often, you know, if your foundation is broken, it's almost impossible to innovate and it's almost impossible for teams to dream. So the foundation is always where we start and then we begin to build on top of that. Mm -hmm. And 
and truly innovation uh, comes with culture, having the right culture as a part of your team, department, or organization. So what do leaders need to do to create and establish that culture where you are able to create and innovate and have that culture of innovation? Yeah, I talk a lot about this in the in the book, Cameron, and you and I also talked about this on my pack, podcast as well, because um, you have some great things in your book as you talk about what um, a culture was like for you, where you were actually mm-hmm. able to think outside the box, ideate, you know, launch new ideas. And so a lot of what I talk about is, um, you know, there are clear things that create a environment of innovation, right? There are clear things that you can launch that will get people thinking innovatively, but there's also things that we can do to stifle innovation within organizations. So part of what we need to do, if we really truly endeavor to have um, not just maybe one person or a department or our CEO own innovation, but if we want the whole organization saying, I own innovation, like No, you own it. I own it. We all own it. If we want people saying that there are things that we can do that will cultivate innovation and there are things that we can do that will kill innovation. So really being able to parse those apart and look at it uh, honestly and say, well, what's in my organization that's killing innovation, stifling it? And then what's in my organization that's actually unleashing organization, uh, you know, innovation. So there are things like, and I talk about this in the book, really fun things we did, like idea competitions, innovation competitions. But part of that was to pull ideas out of our frontline people and say, no, we want to hear from you. We want to know, you know, what are you hearing from customers? What patterns are you seeing in the market? And not only do we want to hear from you, we want to invest in your idea. If it's deemed, you know, kind of the the next big idea, we want to invest in you and that idea. We're not going to take that idea from you and then go run with it implement it on our own, we're going to, you know, kind of seed fund you to go make that idea successful. And so there are just small and big ways that we can unlock innovation within or- our organizations. Awesome. Where you talk about ideas, there's this, this principle that you, you, you wrote in your book. If you are holding an idea until it is perfect, you've probably missed your moment. When mm-hmm. I read this, this one really stood out to me because I'm a perfectionist and I like to perfect that idea before even giving it a go. So can you unpack this principle and and what does this mean? Yeah, this is for me where I see entrepreneurs, where I see large organizations make the biggest mistake. And that is that they're holding their idea too long. They're holding it, trying to make it perfect. But a lot of what I talk about in the book, especially in the chapter, get out there and see the world is, you know, we have to get out behind our desks. We have to go get into the market. We have to talk to our customers and our customers are going to give us uh, kind of that instant feedback that we really need to receive. So part of what I talk about is, you know, taking your idea out there as a napkin sketch. And do I literally mean draw it on a napkin? No, what I mean is it should feel really low resolution. Like you should have spent, you know, 10 hours on it, not a hundred hours, right? So something that you, it's well enough thought through that you can have a good conversation with somebody, but not so baked in that the person feels like they're going to hurt your feelings if they tell you they don't like your idea. And I share some things in the book where, you know, I did go to customers and talk about my ideas and I've had customers tell me, I hate that. That's a horrible idea great, tell me more. Because as you tell me more, now I'm really solving the problem that you want me to solve, not the one I think you want to solve. And so sometimes when we hold our ideas so they're perfect, we miss our moment. We miss the moment to get the idea out in the market. And so once we start to release that idea in the market, that's when the momentum builds and that's when Mm -hmm. customers give us feedback and that's when we can evolve that. So if you think of of our product as almost like a version one, you know, we know once we get in the market, maybe it's a version five, and then we're going to get feedback and take it to version six. A lot of times what we do is try to take it to version 10 and then release it. And so what happens there is we've missed, we have missed our moment. We've kind of missed the momentum and we may be off on what we actually wanted to build for the the client in the first place. Mm. How do you keep that balance of what you want in that innovation versus what the customers or your audience want because I know I struggled with that in a lot of different experiences it being in the workplace providing ideas uh, how do you have that balance 
This is hard. I mean, let's just be honest, right? Because a lot of the reason why we pick up an idea and run with it in the first place is because we have some own personal passion behind it, right? Our personal passion is there for, for this idea. But oftentimes what happens is if we don't keep the customer front and center, we start to build things based on our opinion, not the customer's need. And so part of the way I do that, and there's a framework in the book that's an empathy map, is I get that empathy map out. And um, not only does that empathy map tell me what is my customer thinking and feeling, it tells me, you know, what are they doing on a daily basis? What are they seeing in the market? Um, it goes through all these tensions, right, and feelings that the customer has. But the last portion of that is something called pains and gains. So I look at what are the pains that they're feeling and then what are the gains that they may experience if they use my product. Now, my next step is actually to look at those pains and gains and ask myself, is what I'm about to release going to hit a pain or a gain? If it's not, then I may be building that for myself because I think it's a really cool bell and whistle, but they may not actually care about it. And so usually it's that point that I'll go take this idea to the customer and say, hey, I'm thinking about adding this in. Does this matter to you? Is this something you care about? Nine times out of 10, they don't. And, and that's, you know, obviously disheartening to me because, you know, I love invention and innovation, but to me, we're not, in, we're not doing innovation for the sake of it. We're doing innovation because it solves a problem. It hits a need in the market and it helps someone. And so if I'm looking at it through that lens, then I have to back up and say, does it matter? And I like to use that empathy map to help direct me on uh, am I solving a real problem for them? Am I making their life easier? And if I start to say no to those things, then I realize it's probably something I'm excited about, but I don't know if it's going to matter to my client. Yeah, I just recently had a neat experience and it was a very, uh, it was eye opener for, for me and some of my partners that started a new venture is we were, our mission uh, was talking all about how great this new venture is, how awesome this company is. And we had uh, a great mentor of ours come, we were like, take it apart. Like, can you perfect this and provide poke holes through this, this mission that we had? He's like, no one cares. He's like, <laughs> no one cares how great of a company you are. He's like, you're not touching on the pain points of your audience or your yes. clients or your customers. He's like, you have to go after the pain points um, uh, because we shifted it from the focus on us mm -hmm. and then moved it towards what is what are the pain points of our audience and then that really changed our whole vision and mission that's spot on and you know i feel like when you know we probably all could do this audit on our websites and then we would just be really embarrassed but you know when, when we go to our website we have to ask ourselves this question like you just said am i drawing out the pains and gains for my customer and what they're thinking about or is this website about me and my story and my journey? And am I the hero? And if I'm the hero on my website, then you're right. Nobody cares. But if I can figure out a way to make them the hero, then they might be more interested in doing business with me. And so this is something I think that we really, we all struggle with it, right? Because we love our own story and we want to tell it, but the customer is coming to you to find themselves in the story that you're telling. They're, they wanna see themselves winning. They wanna see themselves as the hero in the story. And oftentimes we, we make it ma very much about ourselves. And I think that that's spot on. And, and that's really where probably a lot of us struggle if we were to go look at our websites right now. Yeah, for sure. And so with, with great innovation comes also great failures that come with it. Um, so how can leaders, and this is something that's so difficult to overcome is how can leaders overcome failure when putting all efforts towards a new innovation or a new idea? Yeah, this is so difficult. And depending upon the environment you're in will depend on how difficult this is. I mean, I grew up in an environment for 11 years where failure was embraced. Um, it was even celebrated a little bit, like, you know, not, not too much, but it was like, Hey, that was really bad. What did we learn? You know? And we sat there and we talked about what we learned and why, why it failed and what we could do differently. I've also been in other environments where I've tried to run lessons learned and no one would admit to their failure. I mean, the, the thing crashed and burned and no one would admit it. It was right there on the floor on fire and nobody would say so. And so it really, to me, culturally, I think we have to be in a culture that figures out what does it look like to unlock and allow for failure in our culture. One of the things about failure, I think we get really scared when we hear that word, but 
we need to be feeling small. It needs to be, there needs to be guardrails on our ideas so that we can test and try things and we can incrementally learn and grow. So, so often, you know, we see these big fa failures in the market. And I talk about a lot of those in the book, some really funny ones, right? But, you know, when you think about what happened there, there were no guardrails and there was no connection to the customer to ask the customer, do you want this? Is it urgent? Will you, do you want it now? Will you buy it right now? And can I sell it to many customers? So the number has to equal many, not one or two. And so oftentimes, you know, we see these big, broad failures and we think, oh, we can't do failure in our organization. We can if we'll take it down to a smaller scale and we'll create guardrails for people. So our guardrails should pull us back, right? Okay, I went and talked to 10 customers. Everyone hated this. My guardrails say, go back to the drawing board. You need to learn. There's more to be learned from this uh, mistake. And so oftentimes, um, you know, if we're not triggering that learning mechanism, our failures do become really big. But if we can trigger that, that learning mechanism while the, while the idea is small, then we can learn from it. We can adjust those learnings and then we can try it again in a different light. And so that's really where I see a lot of organizations, big and fall and small fail is that they, they wait too long to ask, yeah. does anybody want this? Hmm. That's, that's really good insights. Um, so what do you really hope that your readers, the people that get their copy and read, set it on fire? What do you hope they get out of this book? Yeah, I really want them to set their ideas on fire. Like I, I want them to, you know, I, th I think there's two things here. A lot of times we, we we are steeped in limiting thinking. And it's that that holds us back from starting the business to launching the product to stepping out in faith and doing what we feel called to do. Um, oftentimes fear holds us back. I just did a conference and I said, you know, the top five things that people fear are rejection, failure public speaking, <laughs> mm -hmm. of course, right? That's like always up there at the top. Um, the fear of change and then also the fear of not being good enough. But if you're going to um, make an impact and make a difference in this world, you're going to have to face all five of those fears head on and you're going to have to do it afraid. And so my hope with this book, Set It on Fire, is to just give people a field guide to launch their ideas safely, to feel like they can fail fast, fail cheap, but to feel like they can continue to move forward until they get their idea out there into the market. And just the understanding that, you know, uh, we all start by knowing nothing, but we still have to start. And I just want people to, you know, break the boxes that they've put themselves in to break the limiting thinking that they have and begin to move forward and, and begin to in, invent and invest in the ideas that they have. Mm. So how can people get a copy of Set It on Fire and how can also people connect with you and the work that you're doing? Absolutely. So you can head over to setitonfire.co. Dot co don't go to .com so set it on fire.co and you can check out my book i have um, the book there the study guide the master class have it all right there and my audio book will be coming out soon which i'm super excited about um but you can connect with me there and then you can also follow me on almost every platform at innovation meets leadership awesome well we're going to go into a little bit of a rapid fire as we close this podcast um so what are you reading today or what are some reads that you recommend okay well first and foremost navigation and discovery so <laughs> <laughs> that is for sure on my list but i'm also you know what i'm also doing right now is getting back into some old school reads with like peter drucker and stuff like that kind mm. of going back to some of the business foundations right now as well yeah, those are some good ones with Peter Drucker. <laughs> um, what is one bucket list item you still have yet to do? Oh, man. So, um, okay, go to Africa. Like, that's one that I would love to do. I haven't done it yet. I've been to almost, I've been to over 18 countries in my career, but I've never been to Africa. So there you go. Awesome. And then dead or alive, who would you like to have lunch with? Gosh, oh, that's good. I mean, there's so many good ones. Um, I think- Martin Luther King is probably in my top three. Mm. Awesome. Um, well, Natalie, it was awesome to chat with you a little bit on your book and learn more about the work that you do in the space of innovation. Um, any closing thoughts to our, our listeners? 
Well, you know, one, I would love for you guys to come on my podcast and check out Cameron's episode. It's so good. And we talk about his book more, which I'm beginning to dig into deeper and just um, it's a, it's just a fun journey that he's on, but you know, I just like the biggest thing I want to tell people today is do it afraid, whatever, whatever it is, whether it's writing a book like myself and Cameron have done or other things. Um, the first step with anything you want to do is to do it afraid. So get started today. Awesome. Well, don't forget, get your copy of set it on fire. And the link is, will be provided in the podcast description to Natalie's website. And Natalie, thank you again for being on the podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Thank you so much for tuning in to Navigation and Discovery with Cameron Singh. Feel free to check out Natalie's new book, Set It on Fire. You can find the link to purchase her book and study guide or the audiobook at the link in the podcast description on whichever platform that you're listening on. Or you could go and check out setitonfire.co. Also, if you want to find out more about me and connect with me on social media, you can go to CameronSing.com and find out more. And also follow me on social media. And also don't forget to subscribe on the podcast on whichever platform you're listening on so that you get a notification when the next episode goes live. And also, if you haven't received a, gotten a copy of the book that I launched earlier this year, Navigation and Discovery, feel free to get your copy today at CameronSingh.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And uh, we will catch you on the next episode.